On today's show, we're going to be talking about Final Cut Pro 10, specifically my editing workflow for taking this live show and getting it back on the air, back on YouTube within a matter of hours, three times a week. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here at youtube.com slash photo joseph every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, talking about photography, talking about video, talking about live streaming, and today, talking about editing. Editing video, specifically this show. I do this show live three times a week, at least on a good normal week we do, and I take the live show, bring it into Final Cut, do some basic editing, not a whole lot, not a whole lot, but I do some basic editing to that before we re-upload it for YouTube for release at 3 p.m. the same day. That is the goal every day is to get that thing up there the same day, and it pretty much always happens. So part of that is the speed and efficiency for which I do the workflow. Now, obviously, you've got, you've got a lot of editors. You've got Premiere, you've got Resolve, you've got Final Cut Pro. There's some other stuff out there. Uh, those are the three big ones. I've chosen to use Final Cut. I've been using it for a long time. I really love it. The stuff that I'm showing you today is very Final Cut centric. Being that I'm not familiar enough with Premiere or Resolve, I can't say whether you could replicate this. A big part of what I'm doing in the speed of the workflow has to do with presets and how I've kind of built presets and saved them out. So again, I don't know if you can do that on other editors, but since this is what I use every day, I use Final Cut, that's what we're gonna be looking at and how this whole thing goes. So we're gonna start with the process as it begins right here. So let me explain a little bit of the background of the live show and, and the file that we're actually working with. So you're, the show that you're seeing, that you're seeing right now, is all going through an ATEM switch. And we've talked about this a bunch before. We'll actually link up here to a, uh, to a live show that I did talking about the whole live streaming process, talking about the whole switching process that's in there. But everything that you see is going through a hardware switcher. So when I switch to a close-up camera or an overhead camera or the studio camera, hi Ryan, or back to the main camera uh, or to my computer screen like that, all of that is handled through a hardware switcher. That path, that hardware switcher feeds out a, a single feed that is what you just saw that goes into an encoder for streaming. It's going right now through the Pearl Mini. That's what we're using today. It also goes into a recorder to record a ProRes file. So if we look at my close-up, and there's a reason the camera's all jaunty angled so I can fit everything in here. This is a Blackmagic, uh, uh, what is this thing called? I always forget this thing's called. Bla uh, what is this thing? This is the, the I can't remember, Hyperdeck. That's the one, Hyperdeck shuttle. So that's a Hyperdeck shuttle. That is recording. This only does 1080. It doesn't do 4K. This is an Atomos recorder. I have this up here to do 4K when I do 4K, also as an extra reference monitor. Uh, there's other reasons I won't get into now why I have both of them up here, but uh, this is where the show gets recorded every single day. Audio gets recorded up here. This is the X Air, the Behringer X Air, that is recording my audio signal separately. Now, the reason that I do that is a little multifold, but the main one is because I can record a unique audio feed on there of just my microphone. So, for those watching live, you notice that at the beginning of today's show, when the music came on, it, I let it fade all the way out before I started talking. I don't normally do that. Normally, I just start talking as soon as this camera comes on. I see a light. I know when that camera comes on, I can start talking. The audio is still playing in the background. That recorder is recording a, a unique track of just my dialogue, and that allows me to then mix that with the music later. Because what happens is, and as you'll see, I do a little EQ work on my own dialogue, on my own voice for the final output, and I don't want that EQ to hit the music track, so I have to keep them separate. The recorder, the video recorder, records everything as it's going out to air. There's no separation of the tracks, so I record the audio separately. So that's why I have a separate audio file. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that audio file when we get in onto Final Cut there and show you what I do with that. And then again, the video itself with audio is recorded to the Atomos, uh, to, I'm sorry, to the Blackmagic device. So I get a ProRes file for that. Now that's a really big file, which I don't wanna keep. So I'm gonna talk about my workflow there of, of what I actually do with that thing at the end of it. So I've got the ProRes file, which is video and audio, and that is the entire show exactly as it went to air, but in full ProRes quality. There is a second backup uh, of the video show that is recorded, and that's recorded by the Pearl itself. So the Pearl, both the Mini and the Pearl 2 that I was using before, had the ability to record internally. It is recording essentially what is being broadcast, but it's recording it before it hits the internet. So it is essentially identical to the ProRes file, but it's a lower bit rate because it is an encoded for streaming bit rate versus the ProRes file, which is a much, much higher bit rate. So the quality difference is negligible, but I figure, hey, I can capture the full quality, I may as well. So that's what we're doing there. 
The, and then as a third backup, just because you can, or because it's there automatically, the show that goes live to YouTube is actually stored by YouTube and I can download that file. And I've had to do that a couple of times where uh, for whatever reason, everything else went to pot and I ended up needing that file to pull back from. So it's, it's you know, you can never have too many backups, right? I have actually used those before. So that's the standard recording side. The, uh, just to show you the interface on here, this is the uh, Xair interface. The drive is not there right now, but if it was, you would see a recording interface right here. And that's how I would record the show. Now, this particular show today, I'm not able to record like I normally would because we're routing it through the Perl Mini for a secondary input. And that's going to be the computer screen that we're going to be seeing momentarily. So that's how I've routed it in. Because I'm using, I'm not going to do the demo on my laptop here, like normally, right? I'd switch over here, there's my laptop. We're not doing that. I'm actually going to go into my office where my iMac is, and I've got that routed into the system. And instead of routing it all the way up to the ATEM, I've just routed it into the Mini because it's sitting right there. So a little bit of a different workflow today than usual, but, uh, but that's okay. Okay, so there's a little background, right? So I end up with a ProRes file on the SSD drive recorded by the Black Magic Box, and I have an audio file. When the show is over, I pop those two things out, and I head into my office, which is where we're going to go right now. Okay, now we're in my studio. This is my iMac. Um, we're looking at my 5K iMac here. Normally, I would see a secondary screen. I've got a big, huge screen here. I would have the two side by side. I don't have that because I'm mirroring through the Pearl right now, so I can't have the three screens effectively. Uh, so if I'm bumping around a little bit in Final Cut, it's because I'm working in a much smaller space than what I'm used to, but, but that's okay. This is what we're doing. So let's take a look at the workflow. Let's bring up Final Cut on here, bring up my Mac. First thing I would do, of course, is insert my drives. There's the SSD drive, there's the Xair. Open those up, and this is what I get. I get a file named something like so. So what I do is select that, and I type YMD. That types out year, month, date. That is today's date. That is uh, done by Text Expander, and then I name it, so we'll call this Hoverboard, because that's the video that we're going to be editing. So I've named that file. Copy that name to the clipboard, go down to the WAVE file, and at the beginning of the name, put the same paste it in, the same Hoverboard name. So now I've got these two names that have the same, uh, the same primary part of the name on there. Then I head over to head over to Final Cut. Option N to create a new project, or a new event rather. Uh, creates a new event, put, paste in that same name, make sure it's going in the right library, my photo moments library. I let it create a new project, and I also let it do the first project automatically. So if you click on use custom settings, I can dial this in exactly how I need it. However, automatic is what I want because it will set it up correctly. Click OK. That creates the new library, uh, the new event. Here we go. There's the hoverboard event with a new project. Again, select that name and paste another time that file name in there. So I'm just keeping the file naming consistent. Then I hit Command I to go into import. I go to the Hyperdeck drive. There's the file that I want, but I do not want to copy this to the library. Remember, this thing's big. If you look at the size of this guy, this is almost 50 gigabytes. So I really don't want to fill up my system with that. If I saved every single file at full ProRes size, which I don't really ever need anymore, I would fill up terabytes and terabytes of storage, which I have done. And I finally figured out a workaround for this, which I'm going to show you at the end of this. Um, so I am very quickly freeing off a lot of space on here, which is awesome. Let's go back into Final Cut here. And um, I've selected that file to import. Instead of copying it to library, I say leave file in place. So I make sure I enable that and then click on import selected. Now that's importing. I go to my Xair thumb drive, select that file. And this one I do want to copy to the drive. So I hit copy to library there and import that. And then the next thing that I need to import are the graphics. So this, I make this title card for every show and I actually make this bigger than I need. I make this at full 4K and you'll see why I'm in a little bit here, but I make it bigger than I need. And I have a static show here, but I can of course export this out as kind of layers, elements, if you will. So here's what I do. I go in and I disable my titles. Where's my, um, there we go, disable the title. Sometimes there's more than you know, multiple layers to it. Sometimes it's just one like this. So in this case, it's a picture and text. So I'll go ahead and export this out as a PNG file at full resolution. Export that and I'll stick it onto the desktop. Uh, we're going to call this, I call this, um, what do I call it? I call this title background, just title BG. Put that on the desktop, okay? There's that one. And then I take the text itself, do the same thing, export that out. Again, as a PNG, export that out. And this one is title text. Save that to the desktop. Now I'm always doing two shows. Remember, every show is actually two pieces. There's the, the main show and then there's the Q&A. So I need to do everything I'm showing you I do twice, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole process twice. But in this case, I'll show you exporting the titles out twice. So I would go into this. Uh, I've just exported that one. I would now go in and export out my background graphic with the blur, which is what I create. I'd export that out. 
as a, uh, as a new one for the Q&A and then export the Q&A itself. So I would have four files at minimum sitting on the desktop. Then I go back into Final Cut and let's import this last, those uh, bits of text in here. So I go to my desktop and in this case, I just have the two and I will copy those to the library. Import selected and now I can close out the import window. So now I've got all the files that I need in here. Let's make a little bit more space. I have, there's the project, there's the two titles, there is the movie file, which is probably still importing. Oh no, it's not, of course, because it's not copying it to the drive. Cool thing about Final Cut, incidentally, and I have no idea if this applies to other systems as well, but even, let's just say I was copying it internally into the, uh, into the library, I can start editing it while it's still copying in. That's kind of cool, which is great when you got like a massive 50 gig file because it's going to take a little while to copy. So super bonus there. Love that. So uh, we've got the video file, which is again still on the SSD and then my audio file. All right, here's the first big edit I have to do. The audio file is a stereo file. Select that and go into the audio settings. Here we go. It is a stereo file. However, left and right channel are actually different. Left channel has the entire show. Right channel or channel two is just my dialogue. So I switch this to dual mono and I disable track one because that's the one that has the music on. I only want track two. Then I go back over here and I select both the video file with the, that's the ProRes file and my audio file, select both of those, right click and choose synchronize clips. This is gonna automatically synchronize these. It puts synchronize clip at the end of the name. So I just leave that as it is. I make I leave these both on. I use uh, use audio for synchronization. The system's going to use the audio and disable audio components on AV clips. That means that the final file will have the audio disabled from the video clip, only enabled from the audio clip. Click OK, and this sometimes take a little takes a little while. Sometimes it's almost instant. And there's my synced file. Now I want to verify this before I do anything else. So I'm going to open this clip up and I verify. So you see, we got a lot of dead. Space in the beginning where we recorded audio long before we recorded video. There's the video file. It looks like it's in sync. The waveforms appear to line up, but I'm going to verify it. First thing I'm going to do is make sure that my audio is in sync. It, it should be. But the reason that I'm going to double check, triple check, verify this is because specifically with my recorder, for some reason, I'm having this bug, this anomaly in it where it will lose exactly five seconds and 11 frames at a, on a 24p timeline and it just drops it out entirely. And so suddenly the audio is out of sync. So I got to find that place and I fill it in with audio from the ProRes recording. At that point, it's fine, it's identical, but uh, it's weird. I don't know why I haven't figured this out. I got to send the thing off for service. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but, um, but anyway, I check it. That's the main thing. I just got to check it. So I play in the beginning of the clip and I play at the very end of the clip to make sure that they're both in sync. If they are, then I know we're good to go. Let's go in and uh, verify that. So, here, I'm, talking about. so I'm not hearing an echo in there and I go to the very end and I'm not quite sure. Um, no echo there. So we're good to go. All right. So now that that's created, I open up my Final Cut project, the actual uh, project that we're using here that is still empty. And I select the synced clip, tap E to add that to the timeline. And there is the clip on the timeline. So this is what is going to be the final show. So now I got to start doing the basic edits that I do. So first I have to get past my clock, find the actual opening of the show, figure out where that is. It looks like I was bouncing around for a little while. And this one is, ah, yes, this is the one where I rolled into frames. So I want to make sure that we're starting at the right spot here. So let's back up a little bit. We'll stay right about there. I hit O to mark an out point on the clip on the timeline. Hit delete to delete everything before that. And then I hit play. And we'll fast forward okay, through seriously, this. this is meant for a much younger person than me. But we're going to talk about it today. And then I find the point where I want to start the show. So you'll see whenever you're watching it live, you see this. For those who have never watched it live, you've never seen this before. I reach down, so I, I talk, I get to a point where I pause, and then I reach down and I do the switch, which starts, which triggers the uh, the opening. But I don't want, and you notice here, by the way, you don't hear the opening music because that is not part of this audio file. Um, but I don't want that in the timeline, obviously. I don't want that in the final edit. So I go over here and I get to just after I finish talking, and then I just hit the blade, command B to blade that. And then I will go ahead and uh, kind of shrink this up a little bit to, so that the beginning point, just drag in the, um, the end point over, so the beginning point starts with the actual title. So now it would look like this. Me, but we're going to talk about it today. And it switches around. But now I need the music file. So let's go up to the music. So remember, the music is no longer part of my show because I'm recording without it. So I go up to my reusable assets collection up here. I go to my music collection. And I have three versions of the same track. The main one, which I never use for the show, it's longer. I have the 11 second and the seven second version. The 11 second version is what I use. You see, I've even named it PJPM intro. That's photo just a photo moment. I drag this down. An important part of it, the way Final Cut works, if you've never seen this, it attaches to a track. You can see this is attached to the, uh, to the video clip above. I actually want it to attach or link to the other video clip, the first one. So I 
drag it over to there, zoom in nice and close on here. And then I just move this over so that the beat here, the big beat on it, lines up with the transition into the title. So here we go. But we're going to talk about it today. So that's in place. Okay, excellent. Now I need to adjust the duration of this. If I just, I just kind of randomly drag this over before. If I play this now, the transition from the audio fade out to when I start talking isn't really that great. I don't know why they call these. Yeah, maybe it was okay, but maybe I wanted a little bit tighter. So I'll go in here and I'll adjust it. And so you can see here how you're looking at the waveforms. That's me starting to talk. This is the music fading out. I find a nice point to make that transition in there. So let's say right about there. I don't know why they call That looks pretty good. Now you'll see here on this audio track, we're looking at my microphone. There was some noise happening on the microphone. Maybe I coughed or you know said something to Ryan, I don't know. But that's on the audio file. We obviously don't want that. So I'm gonna go up here and just very quickly add some keyframes and pull the audio levels down to zero. So my mic does not become active until right before I start talking. So that's that part of it. But now I want to animate the opening title. So again, for those watching live, you never see the animated title, but if you've watched the post version, the, the version that's uploaded, we do. So let me just make this a little bit smaller so I have some room to work here. And this is where I use the two pieces that I created earlier, the separate titles, the background, and the overlay text. So I'll take my background and drop that on here, and I'm gonna line it up to the beginning of this, just exactly where the, uh, the clip started. Shorten this up a little bit, and now I need to find the first frame of video where there is the dissolve has started. So I can go one frame at a time here, and you'll see there's no dissolve, and there's the first frame where the dissolve has started. The out point of this clip has already been selected, so with my playhead here, I just hit Shift X, and that extends that out. So now this clip is replacing what was underneath it. So you can look, there was the original, and there's the new one on there. Now I want to do the same thing with the actual text. Let me make this even smaller still. I told you I'm used to working on a much bigger screen. Let's get a little bit more space in here. Let's go to my title text, drag that on top, and shrink that down to the same size. Now that I've got these in here, I can animate these independently. Now I don't want to keyframe them, that's just too much work. So there is this really cool little plugin from a company called Alex4D called Grow Shrink. If you just Google Alex4D Grow Shrink, you'll find it. I think it might even be free, I don't remember. And by default, what this does is it, you can see in the preset here, it goes from a smaller size up to a bigger size. Now, this is the first time that I'm gonna use a saved effect preset. I don't want it to go from small to big, I want it to go big to small. So instead of having to do this every time where I would drag it on, go up to the grow shrink and change this one to one number and that to another, instead of doing that, let me just delete that there, I'm gonna use my saved preset and I will show you how to make the preset momentarily. We're gonna to get to that in a future one. But I have right here Alex, Alex 4D, and you see it says grow shrink, but it's big to small. So this is my version that I've saved. So I take and drag that onto the title, take and drag that onto the, um, uh, the picture underneath. And right now it looks the same, right? They're both going at the same size, but this is where it gets kind of fun. I go in there to the one underneath and depending on the original image, I can make this bigger or smaller, however I want. So I can make that nice and big on there. And now there's a little bit of a, a perspective thing happening. It, you know, it's, it's a little thing. I don't have to do this. It's just one of those where I like adding a little bit something different for the, the uh, edited show, the uploaded show. And so this is just one of those things that I do. One day, someday, maybe I'll do a proper big, really cool intro thing, but this is what I'm using for now. And this is how I've made it just ever so slightly more dynamic. So it's not just the static graphic on there. Back to this. So that opening sequence is now done. So this will shrink down. It gets down to the native size at the end of it, and then it transitions to the dissolve, and by the time it hits there, because it is ending at 0%, we're back to the original size, and the transition goes clean. So if we see it, I don't know why, it transitions in cleanly, and there we go. So that's that part of it. Now I would go through and I'll look for places where I pointed to the screen. So those of you who have watched the show once or twice before, you know that normally what I would do is while I'm talking, I will say, oh, and check out this previous show. And this is an indicator to me while editing. I find this point and I know that that is where a little pop-up's gotta come in. I need to find that point, I mark it in Final Cut and then I tell Ryan who does the job of actually uploading and keywording and all that stuff, I tell him exactly where to put it. So I don't, I realize in this one I don't actually point anywhere so I can't do an actual point but I'll still show you what I do. Let's just say, let's just say for the sake of argument that right there I pointed at the screen. So I decide that's the point. I tap the M key twice to add a marker and open the editor. And then I type in what I want. So it's either video and then the name of the video. And I'll just say, you know, it's that one where I did the thing. Or I'll put in text if I, or link rather if I wanted to link to some other thing. So I'll say video and that other video. I'll do that. And then I command A and copy that to the clipboard. I make a mental note of the time, seven minutes, 11 seconds. I hit done. I hop over to Slack 
And in Slack, I say 711, paste that in, video that other video, and now Ryan's got the marker that he needs to know exactly where to put that when he's doing the edit. So I'll do that for each one of these. In this particular video, there was a video that gets reinserted. So here, for example, if we watch this, uh, if you remember, if you watched this video before, Somebody you'll see. actually knows what they're doing, rides this thing, because that's. I talk about, I'm talking about it, and then I'm going to play a video. But uh, you're going to okay. see it's going to be a little bit messy. Up. Because first I switch over, it brings up the um, the switcher, it brings up my web page, and, and then I finally switch over to the right screen, hit play. Here we go. Yep, turn up the volume. All right, so that's all stuff that the live audience saw. You, the, the recorded audience doesn't need to see that. So I can cut that out. Also notice there's no audio in here because again, I'm using a track that is just, just my dialogue. So I would at this point insert the video. And that's just a case of finding the right place and going, okay, from there, slice that. So I think let's just do so it. Let's get the right camera up. So I'm I, right like, I don't need to cut that. I don't need to have that in there. So let's listen. Far more impressive thing, because that's far more impressive. Uh, let's see, let's get the right camera. So right after far more impressive, that's a good place. More impressive. So we'll take that, blade that. I will go to the end of this video insert. Where is it? Somewhere around here. Find where I come back in. So there we go. I'm going to go right about there and I'll blade that and select this piece out and delete it. So now that is gone, I need to insert the original video. So in this case, let me find it. It is up here. It was a whole other edited project. It is a nested project. I think this is it here. Hover gimbal, uh, clip, nope, uh, toggle on the hoverboard. There we go with the color grade. That looks like the right one. So I would now take that, insert that in, and I might do a transition in there or whatever. But simple thing is now I've got the video in there with the right music and everything else without the, um, without the, uh, the fussing around in the beginning. So now let's say that I want to add a title. It's, it's not very common that I do this, but sometimes I want to add either a lower third or maybe on longer videos, I'll bring in a thing in the beginning that swipes up with time code. Or if I've got a guest on there, I want to put their name or just it's anything. I've kind of standardized on how I do my title and my transition on here. And of course, that is templatized as well. And let's just say that I want to put a lower third here. So I'll position the place where I'm going to do it. I'm going to hit Control T to create the title. Zoom in nice and close on that, and we'll select that title in there, and let's just call it, let's just say I wanted to put somebody's Twitter handle, so I'll say um, follow at photo Joseph. Oops, it helps you spell your own name right. Photo Joseph, there we go. So I've got that, there's my little title thing. I go up here to the text presets, and I choose a preset that I built earlier, and it's called Swoosh Text. That chooses the right font, right size, and everything else. Now I can position this wherever I want to. So we're going to put that down here. Now it doesn't, it's kind of, you know, iffy if you can read it clearly on here because there's other stuff behind it. So I would now go into my graphics generators, take the custom color generator, drag this underneath here. I'm going to use it as black. That's fine. I'll select that and go into the cropping tool. So let's go to crop on here and crop that down so it's just behind the text. And the way, oops, the way that I do it, I usually, come here you, there we go. I usually leave it coming off of the side so it's it's like so. So that's about right on there. I think that works out pretty well. Hit done. That thing is still selected. I'm going to take the opacity down just a little bit on there. Not too much, right? If you take it down too much, it becomes kind of pointless. I'm usually around 90% or so. So I might just go in here and type in 90 and that's good. So there's the text, but it's not so, yet animated. Um, obviously, you it just pops it in. Time. So now we're going to animate this thing. So the way I do that is using a transition. Go to transitions, I go to movements, and the one that I want is called uh, just slide, there it is, or I'll just search for it down here. Take slide and I drag that individually onto each one. Yes, I could group them and do the whole thing together, but there's a reason I don't, you'll see that in a moment. So let's zoom into this, let's see how that transition comes in. Um, obviously you can buy it anytime, so that slides into screen perfectly. If you select the transition, you can see up here the type is a slide in or a slide out or slide push or slide swap. I want slide in and the direction that you want it to move, I want it to move to the right, so that looks good. So that's so fine, anytime. but what I like to do is separate out the timing on these a little bit so that the underlying bar comes um, in first. Buy it anytime, but so it's just a little bit um, more layered anytime, but to the dynamism in there. And then we go to the end of it, I can change the duration, whatever I want. And if we just hit play now, you're gonna see something really messed up. That's the affiliate link on there. That ain't right because it's going the wrong direction. So I select both of these. It is a slide out and it's gonna slide out to the left. And now it's they will nice slide out affiliate. the way they're supposed to. And once again, I'll change the duration of the text one a little bit so that nice it goes out affiliate. first, like so. And so now I have my full title. So it opens like so, it and it leaves. Click my link. That's always nice. That's the affiliate link. Like that. So there you go. All right, so that I would do wherever it is. That's effectively the editing that I do. The uh, I, There's more to the project. Don't worry, we're not done yet. But that is the, the amount of actual editing that I'll do to the show. If there's a clear mistake, uh, like there was recording today's show, for those watching live, you know that something's getting edited out. For those who aren't watching live, you'll not know this. But 
if there is a, a glaring error, then I will cut that out. And I, because I do my own editing, I know, I know what it takes to edit it out. And I know that if I want to make a clean transition, I need to make sure that I'm not talking or that if I'm going to repeat a sentence that I say it in the same way, that I say it in the same way, that I say it in the same way so that I have an easy transition to cut from one scene to the next. So all of this I'm kind of managing in my head while I'm doing the live show. And then when I sit down afterwards, I go, right, there was that time when I turned the camera on and it wasn't in focus and I had to go over and refocus it. And there was a time that I switched to the computer and it had the wrong thing up on screen. There's, we don't need that. So those kind of things I got to keep in mind for the edit. I'm not going to do any of that editing now. That's pretty just basic editing, but that's the kind of stuff that I would do if needed. The last thing that I'll do to this project is add the ending title sequence. So for those, again, who have watched this not live, seen the recorded show, you know that at the end we go up to what we call a four square, which is where I put my final graphics. So let's get that in place next. So I find the end of the show. Um, oh, I almost forgot. There's a Q&A in here somewhere. So it looks like, where, there we go. There's the Q&A part of the show. So here's what I would do on the edit. Notice it's all one file, right? The main show and the Q&A are all one file. I get to the end of the show talk about and uh, we'll be right back for that stop that and I blade it there at this point I go oops not the import I go back to the project view and I find the right project we're looking at the old one here we go there's the project that we were just working with I can hide that I now duplicate this so command D to duplicate that and I rename this one Q and A so that's the Q&A show that's up right now this is what I will continue with later to do the Q&A so I would basically open this up select everything except for that last part and hit delete and there's just the q a portion that i'm going to work on back to this piece i've selected i've uh, edited this all out i cut off the q a at the end so now i just delete that from here so that that's just how i very quickly go from the q a portion to the uh, the regular portion to the q a portion okay so now i'm going to finish this remember i talked about the four square so let's go back into the browser in here go back up to my reusable assets up here and we call it the end screen the end screen there's two versions of the end screen there is the end of show end screen as, and there's the Q&A next end screen. The differences here are the text that shows up on the screen. So the Q&A next one says now watch the Q&A and we drop the Q&A into there. And these are the same, subscribe, um, YouTube thinks you'll like this video. This is one that gets randomly positioned by YouTube and then check out more photo moments. This is where we'll see the playlist for the photo moments. If we look at the end of show one, it's largely the same. This, we changed the text on just a little bit. And this one is where the um, YouTube thinks you'll like this video next. So this is, we would put something we specifically want you to look at on maybe a, a promoting a workshop or whatever that might be. And then that's the random video. So two different end screens. So in this case, the Q&A is next. We're going to use the Q&A next one. I drag and drop that onto my timeline here. Make it a little bit shorter. It needs to overlap because this video is eventually going to fade out and show just the four square. And now I need to find a position to transition from the full screen here to me being positioned up in the top right corner. And so to do that, I'm going to look at the video, look at the waveform and try and find a nice clean break in the waveform. That's, that's what I usually look for first. And I'm looking for something where the duration of the rest of the shot is not taking the entire card. Um, I don't want it to be super short like this. That's just too much. I don't want it to be I'm super long, so there's hardly anything here. So I got to find something in between. In this case, I got lucky. It's a nice, easy one right there. Sometimes I need to cut it somewhere else, but this is where we're going to put it here. And so I would maybe at this point, I'll just kind of listen to it and make sure that it really is truly good. So I will select this and hit V to hide that momentarily so I don't hear it. I'll listen to the dialogue and see if it makes sense as a place to cut into the Foursquare. Manual about the off-road, water, weatherproof. We sure, why not? In fact, I'll just move it up a little bit so it happens just as I bend down and uh, the dialogue goes quiet. So at this point, I got my playhead there. Select that, hit Command-B to blade that. Turn this video back on. And now this top video needs to be resized. So I could go in here manually and go to the transform thing and, and kind of position this and resize this and try and get this up here. But that would be a silly waste of time. I want to do, I do this as a preset. So what I did to build the preset was I found the exact right position for this. So I went in numerically and I got this exactly in the right position. This isn't it, but I got this in exactly the right position. And then I go down here and I say, save effects preset. When you click on that, it asks you what you want to save. In this case, the position and the scale. I want both of those. I give it a name. You know, call it whatever I want in here. Give it a category, a place to save it. In this case, I'll save it to my Photo Joseph folder and hit save. Now, I've obviously already done that. So I'm going to cancel that. I'm going to go back over here to my effects browser, go to my Photo Joseph one. And here's one is called Foursquare Placement. You can see exactly as I roll over it, what's going to happen to the video. I drop that on there and it positioned the video exactly in that corner. So now we're going to go from this 
to this. Let's go ahead and get out of that mode. We're going to go from there to there. Now, the music in the background is going to be too loud at this point. About the you're not going to be able to hear me talking. So I've got instructions to myself right here. Drop under the VO. It means under the VO, but drop VO to minus 20. So I will go in here. We'll tap the R key to select a range. Go to this audio file. Select the range where the video clip is. Put my cursor over the... Uh, the levels dialog, the levels adjuster, level, whatever that's called, levels bar, and adjust this to minus 20, which is easier to get exact when you have a bigger, bigger uh, timeline, bigger thumbnail strip here. Uh, close enough, minus 19. And then I hit play again. Manual about the off-road water web. So that works good, right? So now at the end of this, built into this uh, this rescaling preset is also a fade out. So you can see here, you can actually see what's happening to the opacity up here. You see how it fades out. If I open this up and show the video animation, you can see the keyframe there, and you can Talk see about, that it goes we'll right back that. like so. And if at any point I go, oh, that transitioned too quickly or whatever, I can change that if needed, but it's pretty much always left we'll as it we'll is. Right back that. And there it is. So there's the entire file. Now, remember I talked about in the beginning how I've got a separate audio track, which we did the whole syncing of, and there's a really good reason for this. The reason being, I want to be able to EQ my voice uh, maybe there's some, I don't know, maybe there's a bump or something I want to remove or noise removal or whatever it might be. I want to be able to do that and not affect the music track. Because remember, the opening music played, if that was part of the, if I was editing the final video with the music mixed in, any EQing that I did to my voice would affect the music. In the case where I've got the video file that I played on the computer. Here, I, I replaced it entirely, but I may not do that. Um, and that music file would then be a part of it. And so th that music would get EQed. So that's not okay, right? I don't want all this other stuff getting EQ'd, I just want my dialogue, which is why the dialogue has to be, be kept separate. So now that the dialogue is separate, there's an important differentiation between the dialogue and the music tracks on there, and that's something called roles. So let's go ahead back into Final Cut again. And you may have noticed already that um, like the music track over here is green. That is because it has a audio role of music that's been assigned to it, and that was assigned in the browser before I ever added it to the timeline. So if you look at my music tracks here, if I select that same one here, look at the audio role, that's already been assigned to music. So when I drag it onto my Final Cut timeline, it already is known as music. If we look at the end piece here, uh, that has got the same thing. Uh, the video that I dropped in manually, I would have to go in there and manually assign it to music or whatever it might be, but I would give that a different role. So I go into assign audio roles and I would assign it to whatever it is. This is important because of the next step. So here's how I EQ all of the dialogue all at once. In this case, there's no real edits, but let's just say there were 100 edits in here. You don't want to have to EQ every single piece of that individually. So I select everything, I hit option G, which is kind of like a group, and then I name this with an all caps audio at the end. This is my indicator that I know this is the file for final audio treatment. I hit OK and it all collapses to a single track on the timeline. Now I go up to the view menu and I choose show audio lanes and now I see my dialogue in blue and the music in green. And you can see very clearly here what's going on. Let's, let's make this a little bit bigger even. You can see on here that there is dialogue there's no talking here. Look, there's the intro music. This is where the music would be for the video that I inserted. I just didn't do the right one. Um, and then here at the end, there's music over my dialogue. And then you can even see here where it gets a little bit louder. You can see how that ramps up to get louder as the dialogue ends. So I want to affect just this lane right there. So once again, I'm using a preset. I go down to my presets here. I'm constantly tweaking it. So here's version seven of this. I drag this on and that has now added that audio preset to it. So what is that audio preset? Well, let's take a look. Up here, I've done a few things. I have raised the bass volume of it, plus 6 dB. That's to compensate for it being a mono track from the original stereo track. I've added a denoiser, a channel EQ, and a limiter. Now, this is really important. I don't just hit render at this point. I want to make sure that my dialogue is all sounding good, that the levels are all sounding right. Every day, the mic goes in a slightly different place. Ryan is monitoring in real time, and he's going to adjust the levels and try and get them. You know, if, if I move the mic too far away or had it too close, he's going to adjust that. Or just for whatever reason, today I'm talking a little bit quieter. Today I'm talking a little bit louder. There might is any number of reasons that the levels could be a little bit different. But I want consistency from my output to YouTube. So at this point, even though for most shows, I don't have to make any changes here, I always, always check it. Now, I want to check my levels, but I need to turn off the limiter because if I just hit play and I'm looking at it, it's never going to peak because I've got my limiter and they're keeping it. So I turn off my limiter first, make sure that my levels look where I want them to be, and then I add the limiter for those occasional peaks that might pop in. So that's that process. Here's the three things. The denoiser, which is just set to a, this is the built-in Apple one. Um, it's just a white noise filter. It does very, very little, but it takes out just a little bit of background hiss. We've already gotten rid of most of it, but this just gets that little tiny final bit out. 
There's the channel EQ, so I can open that up. We can see the EQ the way I've EQ'd that. And then here's the limiter. So the limiter I have limited to minus one and a half dB. That is my decided upon mastering point for YouTube. So I will turn that off and then hit play. Okay, let's switch cameras here. And now so I'm watching the works. levels over here. Actually, ooh, that's and dark. I want this to be right around well, here, one and a half, here, up out. close ooh, to zero. There's okay. light on this thing. And this All right, is so let me great. give you a quick tour of this thing. All right, so this, this point, a... that's fine. I know we're good. If for whatever reason it was hovering more around minus six, then I would go in here and I would adjust my gain. Or if it was a little bit loud, I would adjust the gain here. So this is where I make that kind of final levels control. And then I go ahead and re-enable the limiter. So that is now all set and ready to go. And if I had made any changes here, I would make a mental note of that because I'm going to need to do the same thing to the Q&A show. So at this point, this is done. I would now uh, do the exact same process for the Q&A one. I, obviously, I'm not going to do this whole thing twice, but I've got that ready to go. And now we're ready to send this and the Q&A file off to Compressor. So we go back to this view, select that video file for some reason. And, and if anybody at Apple's watching, will you please give me the ability to select multiple files and send them to Compressor at once? That would be kind of obvious and nice. Anyway, so I have to do this one at a time. So I grab that one, send the compressor, and then I would repeat that for the Q&A one. So this will launch compressor. And of course, I'm going to be using a preset in here as well. So let's take a look at my presets. Where's my presets? There we go. So I've got two of them. I have PJPM, that's Photo Justice Photo Moment, and Alert Ryan. And here's another one, PJPM, for the Q&A and Alert Ryan. So and Alert Ryan, what is that? Well, here's the video file. So I just drag this whole preset onto here. It is setting it to a specific location. That's a network drive. It is giving it a specific name. That's Photo Justice Photo Moment with today's date on it. And if we, that is all set, in, by the way, under locations. If I go into custom locations in here, there it is. And I find Photo Moments renders. There it is. And if we look at the details on this, let's make this a little bit bigger. It is a folder on the media drive. The file name is Photo Justice Photo Moment with today's date. The Q&A one is actually the same. It just adds Q&A to the end of it. It is going to the same location. But this little, this little uh, setup has something extra to it. It runs an automator workflow. So I can look at what this automator workflow is. Let's go down here. Action, run automator workflow. And that is running what is effectively an Apple script. Let me open this up here. I'm going to reveal this in the finder. There it is. So this is the one that I would normally send I, I, or normally use. I've made a duplicate of this that doesn't have Ryan's phone number in it. Ryan, you're welcome. And this is the Apple script that it runs. It's a very simple Apple script that sends using iMessage or messages, sends a script to him. So it sends, P, sends this text, PJPM render is complete, to my friend and there's, there would be his phone number. And that's the script. So if you need this script, just freeze frame this and, and grab that. And that, we can quit out of Automator now, that will send a text message to Ryan that this is done once it's done rendering. And it does that both for the Q&A and for the regular video. So that is that aspect of it. So now I've got, I, I'm essentially done at this point with the work, right? I've done the edit, I've sent it off to, to Compressor, and then Ryan's gonna take over from there. The last step is to deal with that huge ProRes file. So I've got this huge ProRes file that I don't want anymore. I don't need it anymore. I mean, I still need it for the render, but once that's done, it's up on YouTube, I don't need it. You know, you can make an argument that you should never get rid of the media. You always keep it high quality, but it's like, it's a huge file. So what I was experimenting with was ways to save space on this. And once I'm done with this, I figure if I ever need to go back to the source file, if it's compressed a bit more, I'm going to be okay with that. Considering that the files that we get off of our cameras are, uh, you know, like, what, 10, 20, 30, 40 megabit, depending on your camera, whatever it is, way less than the couple hundred megabit that we're getting out of this thing, it's like I, I can live with a little bit lower quality file in here. So I take that original source file and I run it through a compressor preset that obviously I've already built, and I'll show you that in a moment, which will encode that into an MP4 file and drop it into a specific location. And then I'll go into Final Cut and I'll repoint the, relink the file from the original ProRes source to the compressed version. Final Cut doesn't see that anything has changed. And just so you know, I've done a bunch of tests and done differences between them and the differences are so negligible for my uses here, I'm perfectly fine with it. So, all right, so let's just say this one's done. Oh, I would obviously hit Start Bash and that would go. I'm gonna delete that for now. Um, so now I'm ready to take the original ProRes file. So here's the ProRes file on the HyperDeck SSD. Drag that guy in. And then I take my downsize to H.264 and I drag that on. And again, this is a preset. This is a preset that is putting it in a particular folder called Downsized. And the encoding settings on here, I did a bunch of tests and I ended up just leaving everything at high quality automatic. So I go best quality multipass, but auto keyframing and auto data rate, and it chooses a nice high data rate that gives me a reasonable file. I have experimented with doing ProRes proxy. And just so that you can see the differences, let me have this set up here for you. Uh, video RAID 1, here it is. 
Here's in a previous video. So there's one rendered out as an H.264 and one as a ProRes proxy. Remember, this file started off probably around 50 gigabytes. It gets down to ProRes proxy around to 13 gigs. The H.264 is under 6 gigs, and it's, it's good enough. I mean, it really, I have such a hard time telling the difference between them that I'm fine with that. So how do I actually relink it? So let's just say for the sake of argument that I've already rendered this out. I would be seeing a file of the same name sitting right here, and there's the one that I've, I did this earlier. So let me actually let me make this the exact same name because that is the earlier original file. So we'll go hover gimbal, oops, uh, there we go. So this is what I would get out of it. I would get this file right here. There's the encoded one. See, this file was 6.38. Remember, this started off at 49 gigs. There is my final file. It's got the same name on it. At this point, I'm done with this drive. I would eject this. Now let's see if it's gonna let me. Um, I think, yeah, other apps are actually using it right now. So, you know, we're going to kind of force it out of here. I'm gonna do something really, really bad. I'm just going to unplug the drive because I want Final Cut to lose it. And it's going to complain at me, but that's okay. So I go to Final Cut and oh, missing file. Look at this, all these warnings. It is gone, the file is gone. That's okay. I select this, I go up to Relink, uh, where is it? There we go, Relink Files. There's the file that's missing. I locate selected. I now go into my downsized folder, choose the same file, exact same duration, same frame rate, same everything, it's just a different codec. So Final Cut doesn't mind that. It relinks them, and now I've got that file back in place. Boom, and there it is. So now I have just saved a massive, massive amount of space on there, and, uh, and I no longer have to store that huge 50 gigabyte file. So that, is that process, that's what I do. Let's head back over to the main studio and we'll launch into the Q&A and see if you guys have any questions that you want me to, uh, to answer there. All right, back in the main workspace, let's see if there's anything going on in the chat room. Uh, there were a few things in here, so yeah, we're gonna do a Q&A. So if anybody's got any questions specifically about what we were just talking about here in Final Cut, uh, hold on to those, we're gonna do a Q&A right now. Also, it's a little bit late for this, I wanna remind you of our value for value proposition here on the show. If you feel like you learned something today, if you learned something useful in today's show, please consider putting value back into the program. Head over to photojoseph.com support, and you'll find all kinds of ways to support the show there, including becoming a paid member of photojoseph.com. There's information on there on what that includes, and we're talking about more things that we're gonna add into that. So that is that, please check that out. And of course, if you haven't yet considered it, I can't imagine nobody knows about this by now, but we're going to India next year, big photography workshop in India in, uh, from January 30th to February 9th of 2019. You can learn all about that at photojoseph.com slash India, and I will teach you whatever you want to learn about while we're there. Sound good? If you have final cut questions, we can do that. All right, guys, let's uh, jump into the Q&A. We'll see you in a moment. 